being interested in how, you know, cool everything looked, all the flashing lights on the ICOM radios or, you know, the sat PC32 display or something. I was like, I think I want to get my license too. Uh, so I think when I was uh, 11 or so, I got my technician's license. And then since then, I've slowly built my way up. I'll say that for anyone who's young who wants to get their amateur radio license, don't be discouraged by the fact that you don't know everything the second you take that test. It's a license for learning. Um, at age 11, I couldn't tell you much about a Smith chart, but now as someone who's graduating with her double E degree in December, I can. Welcome, everybody, to another Ham Radio Perspectives. My co-host, Tom, is on vacation, but with me is a spectacular guest. In fact, one of the up-and-coming ham radio operators that is already influencing the hobby for good and doing so as a woman. I love it. The guest is Audrey McElroy. I'm going to pronounce it that way, <laughs> Audrey. I know there's some debate in your family about how to pronounce it, but you are amazing. So you were the 2022 Young Ham of the Year uh, with the Amateur News Line, which in and of itself is fantastic. You've been serving as the District 4 Chairwoman for the Young uh, Lady Radio League, which is how I tracked you down. And also you've been involved in speaking, including at the IEEE, which as engineers will know is sort of the top engineering group and you spoke there to a group of women we'll talk about that in just a minute to see what you said to them you also have the radio club of america technical symposium on your resume for speaking there and you got a collegiate achievement award from them as well and if that's not enough gang audrey is president of the radio club at georgia tech university and I suspect that ham radio club there is a moving and shaking operation because the technology departments are so great. It says something about your abilities too, even just to be able to get in there. So all of this stuff is about the great things you're doing, but let's start out with something really simple together to get a handle on it. And that is how in the world did someone so smart with such promise who could go into any career they wanted ended up going into a STEM field, engineering. Yeah. So I think um, I've always been very much of a logical thinker, kind of type A person as, you know, some of my friends would describe me. So I've always gravitated towards, I think STEM, I've always found interest in things, you know, fixing problems, finding solutions, learning what's really going on. So um, initially, uh, I kind of wanted to be a doctor when I was in high school. Now, I, I was already licensed at that point, but I was like, I think I want to be a doctor. I kind of like that world. Um, and I was just kind of discouraged in the end by how many years of school, uh, you know, that would come for this four years of medical school, four years of, you know, residency or whatever. Um, so I said, well, let's, let's think of something that is a little easier to pursue right now where I can fix problems and find solutions. And for me, that was engineering. Um, so my amateur radio background kind of gave me a little bit of a leg up into that world of thinking and problem solving. So I was kind of more pushed towards the electrical side for engineering. But um, yeah, that's where I am now. And that's why I decided to go to George Tech for, or, uh, for electrical engineering. You would have been a great doctor, too. I don't want to put that down mm -hmm. at all, but I'm glad you went in the engineering area and continued your work in, in ham radio. Let's go back to your initial involvement in ham radio. How did that come about? Yeah, so um, a little bit of a backstory. My dad is an engineer, and some years ago, he got interested in amateur radio by a friend who said, hey, come check this out. Come to a field day. Let me show you what this is all about. So he went and I went and I was very little at the time. I think I was like four or five. Uh, I went with him. We experienced it. He thought it was very cool. And of course, he got his license pretty quick. It was a little young for me to get my license. But um, what happened was he got his license. We started setting up our shack at home. So setting up antennas in the backyard, running coax to the backyard in the Georgia heat. Not fun. But um, whether it be uh, the dedication I had at the time towards that or, you know, just 
being interested in how, you know, cool everything looked, all the flashing lights on the ICOM radios or, you know, the SAT PC32 display or something. I was like, I think I want to get my license too. Uh, so I think when I was uh, 11 or so, I got my technician's license. And then since then, I've slowly built my way up. I'll say that for anyone who's young who wants to get their amateur radio license, don't be discouraged by the fact that you don't know everything the second you take that test. It's a license for learning. Um, at age 11, I couldn't tell you much about a Smith chart, but now as someone who's graduating with her double E degree in December, I can. So it's a license to get in there and a license to learn. And that's where I am now. That's a great story and an encouragement for people who may be on the edge as to whether or not they want to even go for a license and an encouragement to women. So let's talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. What has it been like for you in a hobby? We could also talk about in a career that's highly dominated by males. Yeah. So uh, I can tell you at first, my beginning experiences with that would be walking into a ham fest as a, you know, a young teenager, 13 or 14, being like, man, I'm not only the youngest person here, I'm one of, you know, a handful of women. So it was a little intimidating at first. It was hard for me to find a place to where I thought I could have any meaning in amateur radio, you know, because, you know, what do I know? Um, I felt discouraged at first. But what kind of led me down a path of confidence was knowledge. So I found a niche in like high altitude ballooning and uh, satellite stuff in that kind of world. And so I learned about it. I got more involved in it. I ran projects myself. And that started bringing um, my confidence back to me because I thought I have a place here in amateur radio. And, um, you know, so that was my personal experience. And I believe that any woman who wants to get involved in amateur radio should just because of how cool it is, you know, so at first it can be a little intimidating, but I feel that there are a lot of opening um, or there are a lot of people that will welcome you with open arms in the world of amateur radio and want to get you involved and get you interested in the subject. And um, yeah, I'd encourage anyone to get their license who's interested. Thanks, uh, Audrey. I'm wondering when you spoke to the IEEE, you indicated, I think on your website, that you spoke to a group of women there about radio. So these would be women in a field that's dominated by men, and you're speaking with them about radio. What did you say, or what was your angle on that speech? Sure. So uh, for a little bit of context, I was there with the North Hall Amateur Radio League. I was help running their table they had at the IEEE. I think it was the Antenna Symposium, if I remember correctly. So I was there, you know, working a table. And I mean, this is, it's an IEEE event. There are people walking around every, you know, one out of every few people has a PhD. Someone's ahead in this, you know, industry. Someone's in, a CEO of this company. Very important, very, very smart people. And especially plenty of smart women, you know, who have those doctorates and all that experience in the world of RF and antennas and everything like that. And so I was standing there. I had my, my HT. I think I had an aero antenna that would go to an HT for satellite comms. And um, I, you know, was flagging down women saying, hey, let me tell you about something very interesting that I know you already know all the principles much better than me on, you know, all the engineering, the science, the math on. And let me show you how we can make it interesting and what we do with it in our daily lives. And so with my uh, with my HT and my, you know, satellite antenna, I was able to just kind of demonstrate I mean, we couldn't do it in the building but i was able just to kind of show her like oh here's the atlanta repeater or here's this and here's that and you know we're using all those things that they know very well to you know talk to each other around the world or you know plan for emergency communications and they thought it was very interesting they hadn't seen or they just you know weren't aware of how um how technical amateur radio can be you know, and so they found it to be interesting. And I think now a few of those women are probably involved in either the North Fulton Amps Radio League or in the Atlanta Radio Club, both very big radio clubs uh, down in Atlanta. So that was kind of my take on it. You know, just they already know it very well, but just a different spin on it. You know, a, an interesting and fun hobby way to get involved. Yeah, and what a great way for you to do that, because the stereotype of the ham operators over the years that I run across a lot when people find out I'm a ham and they say, oh, are you one of those guys with a with a stogie, you know, in a ham shack somewhere and with a huge tower and you're talking to somebody in Russia or whatever? I say, well, that's part of the hobby. 
but there are other aspects. And then I talk about the kinds of things that you're doing, or I pull out my phone and I get on DMR and I suddenly talk yeah. to, to somebody in Spanish down in Costa Rica or something. And they're blown away by that because you're right. Most of the people, even if they are highly technically proficient and have PhDs, Hey, I'm in that category. You know, they don't necessarily know about where the hobby is at today. And to appeal to younger people, whether men or women, I think we need to showcase some of the newer technologies as well. Do you agree with that? I do. I think there's a lot out there that's really interesting now. Um, I mean, there's all the, uh, the innovations in the world of SAC communications now. They're really, you know, that's really fun. There's all the HAB stuff. There's digital communication, which I think working digital modes is a great way to get someone involved, you know, a woman, a kid anybody involved in amateur radio, I think being able to do that is a great way to introduce someone to what radio is without it being so frightening. I, I as someone who was a kid and who has introduced several kids to amateur radio, I find that often they're nervous about talking hmm. or they're nervous about trying to do CW or something over the air because they're worried they're going to mess up. And that's completely understandable. So um, digital modes and things like that, like WSJT, it's a great way to get kids involved. And, you know, it's fun. You get to see all the colorful contacts and everything. And it's kind of like they're texting. So they're kind of used to it, you know. So I think, you know, that kind of world, FL Digi, a great way, sending um, images over image radio. There's just so much coming down the pipeline. That's just so interesting. And it's involving cell phones with amateur radio. I know there's a lot of people that will say, well, you know, we're amateur radio. We don't, we don't get in the world of telecom. You know, we're you know, very kind of strict in that world. But I think if we can find ways to combine, you know, how, you know, kids or younger people use their cell phones with amateur radio, that's going to be the kind of lifeline for the hobby that keeps it going for a long time. Yeah, very important. And so we as hams, especially those of us like me, males, older, need to be open to the new media, the new technologies, and to consider them a way of, if you will, evangelizing youth to bring them into the hobby. I remember the guy, I can't remember his name, Kawasaki or something, who was a Mac evangelist. You remember? You probably don't remember that. In the early days of Mac, uh, when there was a real competition between Mac and PC and was Mac going to make it and so on, he became a Mac evangelist <laughs> and uh, uh, did, did a lot of speeches and all talking about how great the Mac computer is. And we can talk about how great this digital stuff is in, in our hobby. I'd like to ask you, Audrey, to talk a little bit about how your interests in ham radio relate to what you're studying at Georgia Tech. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I spent, you know, a good bit of my childhood, you know, hooking up antennas, tuning antennas, things like that. Um, so I was very exposed to that. And I thought it would be very interesting to learn more about it. You know, my education at that point with it was very hands on, kind of rudimentary, I'd say compared to where I am now. So, you know, there was all that. And I was like, well, I want to learn more. I want to go to school for this and learn as much as I can about this. And so that's where I'm at now. I applied to Georgia Tech. Um, if you don't know, it's a school down in Atlanta. I'm from just north of Atlanta. So it was close and it was a great program for double E. And it had an amateur radio club, W4AQL. So I was like, this is a place for me. So I started there back in June of 2022. And um, I can say it's it's been the best experience of my life. I love my school very much and I love my program and um, getting involved with the amateur radio club and electrical engineering has been really fun for me. Uh, right now I'm kind of focused in the world's RF and analog circuitry, but um, yeah, I think if it wasn't for amateur radio, I don't know if I'd be in the world of electrical engineering. So I'm very grateful that the hobby kind of put me in that direction. You mentioned your interest in balloons. Yes. Can you say a little bit more about that and how that relates to some of your studies? Sure. So I got involved in how to do ballooning years ago, uh, where I'm from. We launched one with our local club. And since then, I've kind of navigated my way through it. Um, most recently, I'm involved in the Lightning from the Edge of Space Research Group at Georgia Tech. It's an undergraduate research group. Uh, and our whole goal is to study um, lightning from the edge of space, lightning in uh, thunderstorms, things like that. So we actually, our long-term goal, we've been slowly working up to this every semester, is to launch a, a, a high altitude balloon with a ton of sensors and a, um, an electric field mill, which is a, a device that will measure the electric field 
into an active thunderstorm, get data, have it transmitted down over 900 megahertz live telemetry, and then recover it. So wow. I've been part of this group now for four semesters. We've you know come a very, very long way. We have live telemetry working. We have our sensors working. Our final sprint here is going to be to get our e-field mill um, done on a PCB and ordered. But our goal is to launch for fall. And it's been great. And actually, it, it's become an interesting effort kind of jointly between the Amateur Radio Club and this research group because I joined this this research group, I also brought a lot of my amateur radio club friends very slowly over the years, you know, kids that are a year younger than me or two years younger than me are now in the research group. And so it's, it's, it's been a great, great experience for me. Uh, and we should just say that you're not near your home in Atlanta right now, but you're at an internship in Connecticut, right? Yes. This summer I am an, an analog electrical engineer intern for ARCA here in Danbury, Connecticut. So it's been a lot of fun so far. I think I'm about halfway through my internship right now, but I've gotten to work on a lot of interesting projects and gotten a lot of great hands-on uh, hands learning. Have you met any hams there? There is, a, there is a ham where I work. And I know I walked into work on my first day and he came up to me and he introduced himself with his call sign. And I was like, okay, we know we have a fellow ham here. So it's been <laughs> great and actually, I know. So you never know who you run into. And I'm only about an hour from the ARRL headquarters. So I'm excited. I'm going to be touring that place um, this weekend. So yeah, it's been, it's been really fun to be up here in Connecticut. And you think you might be on for field day from W1AW? I should be. I was invited to come operate uh, this weekend. I think on Saturday, I don't know if I'll be there Sunday, but the plan is to work a uh, 6F station at W1AW, the ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. So if you are, I don't know when this video comes out, but if you heard a female voice on field day from W1AW, it might be me. Yeah, I'll try to get the video posted later tonight. And we'll, we'll see where it goes. But uh, this is such a great interview. You're an inspiration. I'm so glad you're in the hobby. I'm so glad you're in a, in a technical program and field that's connected to the hobby because that's where you're going to find more people that you can attract to the hobby more easily, I think. People already have that technical interest. Uh, I like to call it the walkie-talkie effect because when I was a kid, you'd get a pair of walkie-talkies with other kids and everybody else got interested in that. How in the world could you talk one block over? You know, Simple thing. But it's really intriguing once you get smitten a little bit by a love for radio. So carry on your great work and uh, let me know if there's any way that I can help you in some way uh, with any of your projects or your publicity. I'd be happy to do that. So everybody, thanks for watching. This is Ham Radio Perspectives. I'm Quinn, K8QS, and you have been listening to, go for it, Audrey. Audrey, KM4BUN. KM4BUN. 73, everybody, and thanks, Audrey.